Go ahead and open in your Bibles to Acts chapter 4. <clears throat> and being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they had heard, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God. You made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. Who by the mouth of your servant David have said, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly, against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand had purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things they possessed were his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold, and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, he sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things, and the young men arose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yes, for so much. And then Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who had heard these things. So here we are, continuing on in the book of Acts. Um, the title of the sermon is All Things in Common. That the church is at this place where everyone is together of one heart, and they're sharing, and they're blessing, and they're giving to all as there is need. And so just the things that we're going to try to touch on this morning and see in this passage is this idea of having all things in common and what's just beautiful, amazing picture it, uh, it is of Christian love and unity and generosity. However, in the midst of that, we also have to address an issue uh, where people like to point at this verse and others like Acts chapter 2 and they say, oh look, see, the church, Jesus, it taught socialism, it taught communism. And I am going to try as hard as I can to stick to my notes so it does not turn into an anger-laden tirade on that subject. Um, but we will get to that in due course. And then lastly, we see what happens that even among the body of Christ, sin can enter the church. 
And so just to recount what brought us to this point, Jesus, having raised from the dead, appears to his disciples. He teaches them. He ascends into heaven. And then the day of Pentecost comes where the Holy Spirit descends upon the disciples. They go out speaking in tongues. A crowd gathers. Peter gets up and he says, what you see here was foretold. It's the kingdom of God at hand, so repent. It's a sermon of judgment and repentance. 3,000 people believe his message and the church is born. Uh, then as they come into the temple, they see a man who was born unable to walk and they proclaim to him to get up and walk and he is healed and a crowd comes and so Peter gets up and he preaches a sermon and he says, what you're seeing is foretold because it's done in the name of Jesus who is the Messiah, so repent. And the leaders don't like that, so they arrest him and they take him before the Sanhedrin. They say, what is this thing you're doing? And he said, well, because you rejected Jesus, who is the Messiah, you need to repent. And so they said, we're getting tired of this. Stop preaching that message. Stop preaching in that name. They threatened him and let him go. And then, of course, Peter doesn't cow to authorities. They continue to proclaim the gospel boldly. And that brings us to here in chapter 4, verse 32. Let's go through this and kind of see what nuggets of insight are buried in there for us. Verse 32. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. I love it. The very thing that they were threatened and told not to do is what they go out and boldly do. Proclaim the resurrection of Jesus. And it says that grace was upon them. That word grace, literally in the Greek, it's the same word translated elsewhere as favor. That favor was upon them. Favor of who? Well, favor of God, certainly. Looking at his people, following the Lord and the teachings, proclaiming the gospel, proclaiming his name. Absolutely, God had favor on them. But I think also it's referring to favor of the people. That the whole reason the leaders could not touch them, if you remember, is because they feared the people. They had heard the message. They'd seen the miracles. They see the mighty works being done. The people are believing there's clearly something of God going on here. And so the leaders are afraid to touch them. And so what you have going on is this witness of God's power combined with the unity and the love of the church winning favor with the people. As Jesus says in John 13, 35, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And so they are walking in love for one another, caring for one another, unified in a single purpose of sharing the gospel and following Jesus and in doing so, they are earning the favor of the people. Verse 34. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked. For all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. This is the verse. This is the place where people will stand up and say, See there? Communism! You Christians, don't you know your own book? You're supposed to be a bunch of communists. And they'll even point, you know, verse 32 says, The multitude of those who believed, one heart and soul, neither did anyone say that the things he possessed was his own. But they had all things in common. And so people say, look, look right there. There's no such thing as private property. Right? This literally just described what Karl Marx rewords and says, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. Right? If you have and someone else doesn't, then you give and then they get. And isn't it wonderful? It's communism. Why aren't you all communists? Well, probably because I think most of you are well aware, just as I am, that that is only the absolute most thinnest superficial relationship to communism that could possibly exist. If you dig even just a little bit beneath the surface, you see that the things that are taught in the word of God and the things that are encompassed by the ideology of communism or socialism are not compatible. Which, by the way, socialism, uh, that, that word and communism, they're interchangeable. If you read the writings of Marx and Lenin and you know, early communists, they use them completely interchangeably. Maybe the only difference is that socialism is a step towards communism, but there's still all the underlying ideas. 
It is actually a rather sick and cruel trick of the devil that he takes the idea of caring and sharing with others and twists it into such a hate-filled, envious, murderous ideology as communism. However, that word gets thrown around a lot, so I want to make sure you're clear that I'm not standing here uh, just throwing out a derogatory term that this has a specific literal meaning. Right? The words communism and fascism, those things people just throw out to you know, label things they don't like. No, he, here I'm actually referring specifically to the ideology. <clears throat> um, if you look into, like, if you look beyond the propaganda of just sharing and caring and fairness, you actually look into the definition of what communism is. We'll go to Britannica, the website, not the encyclopedias. Do people, anybody still actually have some Britannica encyclopedias sitting on a shelf somewhere in their house? Anyone? Who had Britannica encyclopedias sitting on there? All right, yeah, there you are. Um, <clears throat> this is what uh, Britannica defines communism. Political and economic doctrine that aims to replace private property with a profit-based economy with public ownership and communal control of the means of production and the natural resources of a society. Now, is what we see going on in the early church, does it fit that definition? Right? Many of you who are rather astute are shaking your heads, no, because you know what's going on here in Acts. First, let's just break this down. Is what we see going on in the book of Acts here, is it a political and economic system? No, it's a group of people who see others in need, and so they're helping out. Individuals who are giving generously to care for others. Is it a replacement of private property with public ownership? No. People who own things are selling them to give the proceeds to help others. The things that are being laid down at the apostles' feet and shared communally are the proceeds of the things being sold. It doesn't say that all, everyone gave everything they ever owned to the apostles so that everybody owned in everything equally. They're selling things and then giving of the proceeds to help specifically those in need, not just distributed around the community. In chapter 5, whenever we get into a little bit of Ananias and Sapphira, we actually see that part of the charge that Peter has against him is, it was your land. You, you didn't have to sell it, it was yours. And whenever you got the proceeds, it was your money. How much you gave was up to you. And so no, private property is being retained. Also, just to get a little wonky on this, uh, the verb tenses in the Greek are what's called the imperfect tense. It denotes a past action that is continually going on, which means people who have property are selling some of their property. And then later, they're selling some more of their property, which means they retained private property ownership of their property. It cannot be communism. They still have the property to continue to sell and give. Was it communal control of resources and production? No, everyone still controlled their own resources and still received the production of their labor. They just gave it to the leadership of the church so they could be distributed to those who were in need. Not everyone shared equally. <clears throat> also remember that what's going on here in the early church, this is only maybe a few weeks since Pentecost, a lot of the people we're talking about here are still pilgrims who live somewhere else. And all of their means and their property and their ability to care for themselves is miles and miles away in their home. But they want to stay here and learn from the apostles. And so you have people who are local selling their things to help care for those who aren't so that they can stay and learn from the apostles. However, aside from the economic side of this whole communist thing, that's even still kind of superficial on the idea of sharing um, financial stuff and property. But when you actually dig down into the ideology, communism is 100% anti-Christian, anti-biblical view of the world. First off, it's materialistic. Everything is boiled down to material physical cause and effect. There is no God, it's atheistic. There's no supernatural, it's atheistic. It does not believe in any of that. 
It is based on the idea that the physical is all there is. And that man, and the way we are, is deterministic. We're a product of our society. You are the way you are, according to communism, because society produced you to be that way. It has nothing to do with any kind of internal conscience or decision or will or soul. And so therefore, if you're going to have change in people, it's going to have to be from the outside in. And so that's why it's through systems and manipulation and control of society that they change people, because that's how they view it works. <clears throat> Whereas Christianity says, no, no, you're changed by the inside out, by the Holy Spirit, renewing your heart through repentance and faith and following after him. Communism creates or emphasizes group struggles and divisions that exist within society. And it facilitates division among these groups in order to overthrow the existing structure and move towards utopia. Whereas Christianity in Christ, the bridge between groups or the gap between groups is bridged by unity in Christ. Where the Bible says there is no Jew nor Greek nor male nor female nor free nor slave. Because all are one in Christ. Not unified because we upended the social order and flattened everything out, but because we come together at the foot of the cross. <clears throat> in communism, it justifies violence as an often necessary means of the change and the justice that they are seeking. Whereas Jesus teaches peace and love, not violence. He says, if my followers were violent, they'd be taken up arms. But that's not what we're about. My kingdom is not of this world. In communism, equity is the outcome, the idea that everyone has everything equally, not equality, but everything has, everyone has exactly the same thing. Equality of outcome, that is what is equity. But biblical justice is not based, as, based on equity, that everyone gets the exact same thing, rather it is based on the idea of equality before God and impartiality in justice. You actually have, literally just this morning, uh, on... Um, Wait, do I want to confess that I was on Facebook this morning? This guy I know, no. This morning, uh, I was actually perusing on Facebook, and I saw in a group, someone asked the question, hey, what do you say to someone that says that Jesus was a social justice warrior and a socialist? And one of the things that came to mind, which was funny because I just prepared the sermon, was um, uh, it didn't make it in the sermon, but came to mind when I was doing that, was that, you know, the parable of the talents, he gives to each differently. Here, you get 10, you get 5, you get 1. And then when he returns, they get a different reward. Oh, you get 10, you get 5, you get tossed out. Jesus himself teaches that in heaven, there will be greater rewards. And in hell, there will be greater punishments. A flattening out of everybody getting the same thing is not biblical justice. So what we have in Acts in the early church is not the hideously divisive, violent ideology known as communism. But rather, what we do have is an amazing, beautiful picture of love and unity and generosity within the body of Christ. A selflessness that is just amazing. It's interesting as you stop and you think about it. Think about the story from Genesis through to Revelation, what is the first sin? What is kind of the foundational issue between God and man? It's pride. He's God, and we don't want to listen. We want to do our own thing. We want to go our own way. Think more highly of ourselves than we ought. Well, what happens when you repent and you turn away from the pride where you place yourself as first, and rather you think of others as more highly than yourself? Well, then you get generous. You know what? I don't need to hold on to this thing because they need it more than I do. Here, let me give it to them. And you don't care because it's not about you. You get selflessness. Generosity is actually the natural occurrence of what comes from Christian teaching, right? Because it all belongs to God anyway, right? He is creator. Every single thing in all of creation is his. Amen? We're just stewards of it. We were just placed here to care for it. And then we're told that we're supposed to love one another. 
Love, your, love who? Love one another. Love your fellow Christian. Love your neighbor. How about your enemies? Yeah, love them too. How about people that are persecuting you? Yep, love them too. Everyone. Most love everyone. So much so that Jesus, as I said in John 13, says that people are going to know you're his disciples by the love you have for one another. In Matthew 6, Jesus says, don't worry about all that material stuff, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So what we see is God's people selling God's property in order to care for other people. What's really interesting about this, stop and think about, so far we've had three, there's probably been more, but we have three recorded sermons that Peter have, has given in this early part of the early church. And what has been the focus of those sermons? Warning of judgment that Jesus is Lord and that we are sinners and that he will judge and we need to repent. And out of a message of judgment and repentance, we have a model of selfless love and grace and unity. See, a lot of people want to go like, ooh, that judgment and sin talk, that, that's not fun. Hey, the love and the unity and the you know, caring and community and peace and everything, let's talk about that. That's all fun. People like that message. Well, the problem is you cannot have the unity and the love and the generosity and the peace within the body unless you first have the repentance. Because the very thing that we are needing to repent of is our pride, our selfishness, that wants to put ourselves before others. Ultimately, we want to put ourselves before God, but it also works its way out in our human relationships that we put ourselves before others. So unless we repent of that... We can't have the love and the unity and the generosity and the caring community. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in the very next verses, we're given two examples of how this pride issue within the body plays itself out. Verse 36, And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Here we have an example of faithful, selfless giving to those who are in need. It was a wealthy man who had possessions, and there was need, so he just sold some land. And he, here, here you go, have it. And he didn't go back going, who needs some money? You need some money? I got some money. Come here, I'll give you some money. No, he just laid it at the apostles' feet. Here, you decide what needs done with this sacrificially. He just gave it. He didn't ask questions. He didn't say, hey, uh, the, the, who you got handling this money? Is he actually good with finances? Here, let, let me make sure that your bookkeeping's in order before I hand you some money. What is this going to get spent on? Really, how much is that pastor making? Do I really want to give to this program? How, no, no, no. He just said, you know what, there's a need. Here you go. Leave it to God. And God loves a cheerful giver. Sacrificial, cheerful giving that just lets go with an open hand. However, just as it did not take long in Genesis for sin to find its way into the garden, because there was a serpent in the garden, likewise sin does not take long to find its way into the early church and because of that exact same serpent. Chapter 5, verse 1. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. They saw what happened with Barnabas. They went, hey, we can do that too. And he kept back a part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. What was Ananias' sin? 
I'll tell you one thing his sin was not. And if you ever hear a teaching saying this was his sin, you better hit the brakes, giant red flag. You may want to reconsider listening to that preacher. His sin was not that he didn't give everything. That's not what Peter just said. He just said, hey, it was yours. I mean, while it was your property, it was in your control. You didn't have to sell it. And after you sold it, you had the money. It was your money. I mean, you're in control of it. Why are you lying? See, that's his sin. If he would have come up and said, here, we sold some property. Here's half of it. All right, good, sweet, awesome. But he lied. <clears throat> he chose to lie. More accurately, he gave in to the temptation to lie. Because as it said there in verse 3, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? See, Satan hates God. Therefore, Satan hates God's anointed, Christ. And by extension, he hates God's people. So he will do whatever he may do to thwart the gospel. Scripture says that he prowls about like a roaring lion, looking for whom he may devour, and that includes you too. However, the devil made me do it excuse doesn't fly. Because you still have a choice. You don't have to listen to him. You can choose to say, no, I'm going to follow Christ. I'm going to follow God. But Ananias and Sapphira, they chose not just to lie, but it's why they lied. The deeper sin going on here is a hypocrisy. A kind of false piety, a religious facade of, look at me, aren't I so holy? I sold my land and gave the money. Seeking the praises of men. What's interesting is this is the exact same thing that God judges Israel for in the Old Testament. They praise me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They're going through the motions of religious practice, meanwhile... Not worshiping God at all. They don't care about God. Fake religious actions with prideful hearts. Jesus actually warns about specifically when it comes to giving. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 1 through 3, he says, Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. That's exactly what Ananias and Sapphira did. Look at us. We sold some land, bringing some money. Aren't we great? Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Ananias and Sapphira wanted glory from men. I mean, why not? Looks cool. Looks great. Everybody's running around doing it. Feel good about yourself. Everybody's feeling good about you. I mean, Barnabas got a nickname. When you give only for attention and praise, well, congratulations. When you receive the attention and praise, that's all you get. You got what you were looking for. However, in Ananias and Sapphira's case, they got something far worse. But that'll be next week's sermon, because uh, we don't really have time to stretch out into that whole big mess. Uh, so definitely want to come back for that. However, what I want to look at as we close here today, if I may brag on you a little bit. I am truly blessed to be a part of Liberty Hill Baptist Church, where so often in so many things, you are of one mind and of one heart. The unity that is experienced here. Even whenever we have issues, like in business meetings, where, I mean, there's some big money's been spent lately, and there's been some discussion and some debate, but never got nasty. We're all of one heart, one mind. Hey, we got to do the thing that we need to do to operate the church and serve Jesus. Whenever there's a, a, a ministry that we want to do, everybody jumps on board. Whenever there's a need of someone in the church or even extension of just someone, someone in the church knows Word goes out, needs are met. It's an amazing thing to watch. <clears throat> the fruit of the Spirit being evident in the lives 
of all, most of you. All of you. Okay, all of you. But here's the thing. Let's not grow complacent. Let us, as Peter says in 1 Peter 5, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Even among the early church, as mighty works of God are being done, people are being healed. Holy Spirit falling, fire, tongues of fire speaking in tongues. Joy and unity among the body. Even in that setting, the devil roamed about like a roaring lion, tempting believers to turn from their faith and to follow their pride rather than Jesus. If he was at work there, you may be guaranteed he's at work here. And if they could fall prey to temptation, then surely so can we. That's why the receiving of the gospel isn't a one-time thing that someone stands up and goes, you know, you're a sinner, Jesus died, repent. And you go, I repent. And then it's done and over with. No, it's something that we constantly are doing. As we stumble and we pick ourselves up, we repent. And we read the gospels and we read the Bible and we read it again. And we tell each other the good news again and again as we remind ourselves that it is by Faith is by grace through faith that we are saved. So let us daily remind ourselves of the pride that hides within us all and that we need to turn away from it. Let us daily remind ourselves and one another of the grace and the mercy that we have received from God through Christ. That we may daily take up our cross and follow after him. That little church on Liberty Hill. Come praise the Lord, let your cup be filled. Raise your voices and we'll sing. Let God's freedom ring from that little church on Liberty.